tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Well, hey there, friends. Man, even in the 105 degree heat, I knew you'd show up. Father's Day was last week, Chester. Well, I appreciate the card, but that's a day late and a dollar short. Ungrateful kids. Hang tight, friend. I'll only be a second. Mm. Oh, yeah. You know, the National Weather Service has great advice for weather like this. They say to drink plenty of water and stay cool. Well, no shit, Sherlock. Someone give these people a raise. I tell you, I don't know what I'd personally do without our brilliant authorities. All right, friends, smoke them if you've got them and drink those glasses to the bottom. Because old Drew Blood has a tell to tell. But first, the rigmarole. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. You'll get instant access to the whole enchilada, including hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012. Thank you for your support. Got a story or two you'd like to hear on this show? Send it to DrewBloodHorror at gmail.com. If selected, we'll do business. Tonight's story is a good reminder that if you happen to see tumblebugs, you might be about to tumble into some shit. And before you go complimenting me on my clever wordplay there, keep in mind they're dung beetles, so it may very well be literal shit. Here in Texas, we call them roly-polies, but they still like shit, so, you know, six one way, half dozen another. Anyway, without further delay, from author Steve Vernon, I give you All Wood, Dreams of the Sun. It was late August, time of the summer burn. The sawyers and lumbermen jumped like guilty cats when the rattle of heat lightning scrawled brittle designs upon the distant hills. You could slice the stink of the pulp mill with a log peeling knife. It was the kind of hot, stale weather that made Timmy almost want to lie down like a lizard on a rock, feeling the sweat cocoon and crawl across his skin, thinking of sweat-lodged Indians and the last stand foreign legionnaires. Timmy lay in the shade beneath Granny Jill's lilac grotto, getting drunk on that sweet purple stink that never quite left the bush. The scent lingered in the bark like mildew in a basement. He liked to get down close to the roots. He smelled the memory and promise of spring like it was yesterday, forgetting about how very few short weeks were left before the clamor of a ringing school bell hollered him from out of the shelter of his dreams. Timmy's granddad had planted the lilac grotto the year Granny Jill first wore granddad's ring. Just a few bushes he had traded a day's work in the field for, but they spread like a beautiful cancer. Until now, nearly 50 years since they had first been planted, the lilac grotto was dense enough for a 13-year-old boy to crawl into and hide. There was a heart carved on the central trunk. No initials, just a heart. It could have been carved by anyone, but Timmy imagined it had been set there by his granddad. Timmy liked to sit in the shade of the lilac grotto, the branches twisting around him like friendly old arms, only scary at night when the wind whispered secrets to the moon and the leaves dreamed of flames licking high. All wood dreams of the sun, Granny Jill once told him. It is why sparks dance in the chimney, why smoke rises to the moon. 
Dreams born in the heavens a thousand million miles from here have etched their memory into the bark of every branch. When you throw it into the fire, you're just setting it free to rise to heaven and beyond. Remember that, long as you draw breath and stare at fire. Memories like that lived a long time, like the gray tobacco aroma that tar Granny Jill's breath and skin. Granny Jill's fingernails shaded from yellow to brown like old elm leaves. Her breath heaved heavy and slowly like a porch swing easing back and forth. Memories like that made the wind that whispered behind Granny Jill's tidy movements prickle Timmy's nostrils in a funny smile kind of way. It was here, sitting in the shade of Granny Jill's lilac grotto, that Timmy first saw the tumblebug man. Tumblebugs are those little crawly beetle wrigglers that you find under rocks and logs and old tar paper. They like the darkness and are happy to crawl through the muckiest slime and if you try and catch them, they'll tumble themselves up tight into a ball, figuring to blend with the slow white rocks. They were bugs and easy to kill they were fun to stake out with toothpicks. They didn't burn as neat as ants, and when you squashed them, you always felt like you had to wipe your sneaker. And they always came back. No matter how many you killed, the tumblebugs always came back. They didn't bite or anything, but Timmy didn't like to see them too close to the house. It kind of gave him the feeling they were tasting the house and what lived within it whenever they crawled in the shadows of Granny Jill's whitewashed foundation. Do you got any bread? A voice spoke, wet and burning like a drink of ash soap. The voice seemed so close Timmy almost jumped from the grotto. He looked out from the concealment of the shadows to see a dank and heavy man standing at Granny Jill's doorway. The man looked like a pile of rags soaked in a swamp. He stood there, sort of leaning, like he was sucking something good and juicy out of the door frame. Timmy didn't know it then and there, but he was staring at the tumblebug man. You wait right here, Granny Jill said. Granny Jill went and she got the tumblebug man the bread without even bothering to lock the door. It was something she always liked to do. She liked to feed the wandering men. Granddad always warned her about it back when he was alive, but the cancer crawled into Granddad's lungs three short years ago. He lay down in a hospital bed that stank of pine oil and sawdust, and before the summer had passed, he had soaked into the bed sheets and vanished like rain spilled into a scrawl of moss. Timmy missed his granddad. He missed his mom and dad, dead in a car fire long before he could remember. Granny Jill was all he had left. Timmy sat and watched. Granny Jill knew he liked to hide in the grotto, but she never knew when. Besides, Timmy was so good at fading into the shadows and staying indy and quiet that she often forgot to look. Even if she had known, she wouldn't have worried. Granny Jill was good that way. She never gawked at Timmy the way some adults did, all slow and wary, like you were some kind of germ on legs. She never looked at him like he was something that ought to be sterilized and burned. No, sir. Granny Jill treated Timmy like he was real and grown up, all in one breath. There just weren't many others who ever did the same for him. The tumblebug man looked Timmy's way, squinting like he could smell something hiding in the bushes. Timmy knew he was too far away to be seen, but Timmy slid back an inch or two into the shadows just to feel safe. There's some bread, a dollar for the road, and my blessing for luck, Granny Jill said. 
The tumbled man stared at the bread. Then he muttered something too low to be heard, and then he spat on Granny Jill's pine-oiled porch. Timmy heard the spit hit, hard like a bullet, and just for a moment he thought he heard it sizzle. Right then was when Granny Jill should have slammed the door, but she just smiled. Timmy could see the sun making shine holes out of her glasses, and for a moment she looked like a stranger, like someone seen far away stepping onto the road in the path of oncoming truck. You saw her danger, but you were too far away to help. That was the thing about being young. Timmy always had the feeling when the mailman brought those long, wide envelopes that Granny Jill always said were Bill's, even though Timmy never remembered meeting anyone named Bill. Times when Timmy knew Granny Jill was struggling, trying to lift up something too big and too heavy for any one body to lift. Times like that, he'd lean out to her, wanting to help, but not knowing how. Times like that, he felt too goddamn young. An hour later, the tumblebug man stepped from Granny Jill's front porch. He walked down the long stone path, grinding his heels and swapping them across the green painted stone walkway like he was trying to dirty the rocks. He paused by the lilac grotto. Timmy hunkered back, praying he couldn't be seen. The tumblebug man reached into his pocket and dragged out a handful of fresh baked bread. Timmy could smell it, fresh and full of yeast. Granny Jill baked it every morning, sold some to the market, but always kept a loaf for home use. The bread grew green-gray moldy in the tumblebug man's hand, like it was sitting under a wet rock. Mold and white fuzz sprouts like dandelion seed, and the tumblebug man pushed his face into the handful of moldy bread and sucked it up with a wet suckling sound. It was the kind of sound a straw makes at the bottom of a milkshake glass. Then the tumblebug man wiped his hands across his lips like he was tasting them. Then he unbuckled his trousers and pulled his dangle snake out. He pissed a long hot puddle into the roots of the grotto, not even looking where he was relieving himself. Just leaning back and staring at the sun like he was thinking about throwing a rock at it. His dangle snake was long and dirty, kinda twisted like a root. He moved and twisted like he was writing something in the dirt. The piss steamed as it hit the ground, spattering out a running cascade of dozens of hundreds of tumblebugs, low and scuttering little things that ran towards Timmy. And do you like that? The tumblebug man asked. Timmy pushed back against the central trunk in the lilac grotto, feeling it quiver like there was something out there that could even scare a tree. Timmy got ready to run. He was certain the tumblebug man would reach in under the grotto and drag him out, maybe suck him out like a skinny kicking strand of spaghetti. Not yet, the tumblebug man said. Maybe later. Then he dragged a large pocket knife from his hip pocket, snapped it open. It was the rustiest, dirtiest knife Timmy ever saw. If someone ever was cut with such a knife, they'd surely die from leprosy, lockjaw, and a hundred forms of plague. They'd die slow and screaming, their limbs falling off one by one, making a stink that all the sulfur in Egypt couldn't burn off. Then the tumblebug man used the pocket knife to carve something into the wood. Timmy had seen this sort of thing before. Devil scripture Granny Jill called it. Hobo marks. Signs that might mean this lady is nice, or keep moving, or we'll trade work for food. Timmy could hear the knife working slow into the wood like listening to a rat chewing in the walls, all low and steady. When he was done, the tumblebug man stared one last time into the lilac grotto. Timmy could see his eyes, all watered and yellow like bad lemonade. 
like Grandad's bed sheets before the cancer finished with him. And then he sort of walked away. Only halfway down the street, Timmy finally blinked. And when he finished his blink, the tumblebug man had vanished. The mark on the gatepost was twisted and deep. It looked like the writing made from meat hooks and cleavers, all looped and jagged edged. Just looking at that knife mark made Timmy feel like he wanted to turn and run and lean and grab it at the same time. He touched the knife mark and it seemed to bite him with a thousand tiny wood slivered teeth. It was like sticking his hand on a rattlesnake that had swallowed a beehive, all hot and tingly and hungry all at once. Timmy had been bit by a stickleback perch once, and the knife mark felt worse than that. It felt like the wood was biting him into itself, sucking him clear out of his sneakers. Whatever the sign said, it was real bad riding. Timmy grabbed the rock and hacked at the gatepost, trying to smash the riding flat. Only it dodged his swing. He wasn't sure how it did it, was just like it was there, and then it wasn't. He hit at it again, only this time he smashed his fingers. He danced and swung, cursing loudly, shaking the fingers so the air would cool the pain. The blood from his hand painted the wood like a thirsty shingle, and then soaked slowly and thirstily into the knife-scarred wood. Timmy stared at the wood, the last of his blood vanished while he was watching. The mark puckered and smacked like it was licking its lips. What are you doing to that gatepost? Granny Jill yelled. Timmy dropped the rock. I'm just smashing the bug, he said, and ran guiltily inside. Granny Jill didn't yell at Timmy for banging the rock on the gatepost. She never was much for yelling. Yet she never let him get away with mischief without hearing some kind of scold. But not today. Today she looked tired, like she hadn't slept. There were shadows hung like nooses beneath her eyes, like she'd been up all night worrying. She looked at his finger, making that sound in the back of her mouth. That's going to leave a mark. Then Timmy had to ask. What'd that man do to you, Granny Jill? Granny Jill stared at Timmy like he was speaking in tongues. What man, Timmy? And that was all she'd say. That night, Timmy tossed and turned. He saw a tumblebug scuttling under his bed. Only he didn't dare set foot from under his covers for fear of the looming shadows. Granny Jill must have tossed all night. It sounded so loud from her room, it was like she was moving furniture. Once he even heard her moan, long and low and shuddering, like somebody mean was drawing a hunting knife in and out of her soul. The next morning, there was cold oatmeal for breakfast. There were lumps in the oatmeal, like a pot of bad wallpaper paste, and it tasted funny. Timmy tried to peanut butter himself a slice of bread, but Granny Jill said, No, that bread is for somebody else. Timmy knew she was going to give the bread to the tumblebug man. He ran to the cellar and he got a bucket of paint. He cracked it open and stirred it like his granddad taught him. That fence needs painting, he told Granny Jill. It's time I got to it. Timmy had heard his granddad use that same phrase time and again when the roof needed patching or the grass needed cutting or the branches of the big swamp oak wanted pruning. He'd use these words now like a magic charm and it seemed to work. Granny Jill paid him no mind as he walked through the kitchen with a brush and a bucket of green paint. But the gatepost drank the paint just as quick as it had drunk up Timmy's blood. The bristles coming off the brush like it was a hundred years old and drank them too. Thirsty old riding, isn't it? Came a voice from behind Timmy's left ear. It was the tumblebug man, standing there and shadowing over Timmy like a mountain that had learned to walk. It ought to be thirsty. 
It's been waiting a long time. Writing like that was old when God was still figuring how to count to seven. He leaned closer. And do you know what I'm going to do to your granny boy? He started to whisper, low and wet and hot, pouring the words into Timmy's ear. And all Timmy could do was stand there and listen, having no more say in the matter than a pen caterpillar, staring at the writing on the gatepost, watching it move and twist like a bundle of snakes. Tumblebugs crawl across the riding, dancing like a tangle of scuttling waltzers. Then the tumblebug man went to the house and walked straight in without bothering to knock. Timmy waited in the shadows of the lilac grotto. When he felt strong enough, he walked to the porch. He stood there a long time, like the house wasn't his anymore. He felt the heat of the sun upon the plank porch, felt the soles of his shoes sticking to the ancient paint. Then he reached out for the doorknob. The brass and glass felt hot to his touch. It felt like it would brand him if he wasn't quick and careful. He pushed the door open. It swung like a forgotten wish. Then he walked into the front hall. He walked down the hall and past the parlor and up the stairs. He knew where they'd be. He knew they'd be in Granny Jill's bedroom. He stared at the bedroom door, not daring to touch it. The marks were there too, moving like reflected light, dancing like fireflies over the wood. Timmy heard the moans coming from behind the door. The kind of moans he had heard not a few years before his granddad passed away. Only these moans sounded dirtier, like they had been tainted with something older and fouler than sin itself. The door swung open. The tumblebug man stood there, nakeder than Adam. Those marks, that writing was scrawled in something darker than ink all across his body. Letters squashed so close they looked like scales on a snake. Only the marks on his body were moving. They were scuttling and crawling all across his body. I get done with her. I'll come for you, the tumblebug man said. Timmy ran, leaving Granny Jill there alone with the tumblebug man but not before he caught a look of Granny Jill lying in the bed naked. Stringlets and gobs of gray, moldy slime dangling down from her mouth and hair. It looked like she was dead and fished out of a swamp. Only Timmy could see she was still breathing. Timmy waited until the moon hung its hat on the high sky hook it could find and then he slunk back into the house. He felt bad for leaving Granny Jill like he had did, but there wasn't anything he could have done. He tiptoed up the staircase, eyes glued on the bedroom door like moths to a fire. Before he did anything, he had to make certain sure Granny Jill was okay. She wasn't anywhere near okay lay there making a wet whistling breathing sound, naked and gray and greasy cold like a chunk of dropped bacon. The mold and slime had grown across her, forming the marks that the tumblebug man had carved into the gatepost. Hooks and scrawls warped across her ribs, looked like they'd been rooted and gored into her flesh, and through it all the tumblebugs crawled scuttering dirtily about in her navel and her mouth and her ears in some spots Timmy didn't want to look too close at. Granny Jill? Timmy called. She opened her mouth like she might speak, but all that came out was the kind of moan a dying shadow might make. The kind of moan made you think of thirsty dirt and worms twisting on a hook. Dark sounds hid behind that moan. Timmy felt she was saying whatever words or signs the tumblebug man had carved on her soul. 
Timmy went to the closet and he laid Granddad's old hunting jacket over Granny Jill. Went to her jewelry box and found Granddad's old pocket watch. He wound it and set it by her bed, and alongside the watch he placed a stand-up photo he had got from school last year. He had done all he could for her. Next, he went downstairs to the basement workshop. He knew just what he was looking for. Grandpa's buck saw. He picked it up, felt the heft of it, like a Cree Indian hefting a hunting bow. There was a soft, tattery blue glow in the corner of the workroom. Timmy saw his granddad standing there in the shadows for half an instant, coaxing him onwards like he knew what the boy was up to. It was time to deal with the tumblebug man. Timmy knew just where to find him. Only place low enough for a man like that to linger. Only place where he might find welcome. The hobo jungle, Granddad used to call it. The place where the traveling men would live. The men from the trains, and the drifters, and the gamblers, and the layabouts. Granddad warned Timmy never to go down there. There was things could happen to a boy who wandered too close to the hobo jungle. Men who live too long out of doors get lonely for strange things, Granddad said. It ain't right nor safe for a boy to stray too close to the hobo jungle. That's where the tumblebug man would hide. That's where he'd go. And that's where Timmy had to go, too. But first he had to deal with the gate post. He carried the bucksaw upstairs, out the door and down the stone walkway his granddad painted. Each one of those stones glowed a soft warm green like there was magic in each of them. The gate post never looked so large, standing there like a long white worm. There wasn't a trace of the paint Timmy had covered it in. Every drop of it was soaked clear up. He knelt at the gate post. The writing on it was moving, twisting like it wanted to bite him again. He dug the saw into the wood and the gate post pulled away. Timmy leaned into it, digging the teeth into the gate post back and forth until the saw was singing sweet and clear through the wood. The gate post throbbed like it was hurting. It bound the saw, the fibers of the wood gritting down like they were trying to eat the blade. The hooks and the curls of the rotten leached out, catching at Timmy's hands and arms, stinging and burning where it touched them. Then he noticed how the lilac trees had leaned out and were kind of catching at the gate post, like they were holding it still for him to cut. Timmy started to yell. The wood was eating him, sucking him in, pulling him under. There were tumblebugs all around it, big as rats. He kept yelling, focusing all of his hate and his love behind that yell, making that yell a motor to move that saw lightning fast, deeper, 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 until the gatepost clunked to the ground. It lay there like a fallen beast. Timmy was afraid to touch it. He wrapped his coat around the post, picking it up like it might explode. Then he ran for the woods. He ran for the woods down to the hobo jungle, down to the railroad tracks. He found the tumblebug man sitting by the fire. His skin hung all loose like he was relaxing. He had a big, hungry mouth with flabby liar lips, and he was sitting in front of a large, rusty oil barrel. There was a fire blazing in that barrel, and in the shadows, Timmy could see all the other hobos are sitting a little ways away from the fire, like they're afraid of getting too close. You found me, didn't you? Timmy just stood there, afraid to move. Come on in to the fire, the tumblebug man said. It'll keep you warm. Timmy didn't budge. He was as close as he wanted to get. 
close enough to see what was burning in that oil barrel. Not wood, but bones. Looked like human bone. I burned your mom and dad, Timmy. Your granddad, too. His voice was something that sounded like a snake crawling through dead, wet leaves. I'm burning your granny Jill. And when I'm done with her, I'll come for you. I got riding all ready to carve on that big old lilac bush you hide in. The railroad tracks were flexing and breathing like they were trying to rip themselves from out of the dirt. And sometimes they looked like a fence, and sometimes they looked like a cage. And the tumblebugs were as big as dogs, and were chitlin' and rattling and dancing about like their feet were on fire. And then the tumblebug man lunged at Timmy, screaming across the dirt like there was a rope attached to him. His big mouth and nose wide open, and it looked like he was sucking up the earth and the sound that came from his mouth sounded a lot like Timmy screaming. Only just before he got too close, Timmy yanked the gatepost from under his coat and heaved it up into the fire barrel. The barrel started simmering and cooking and heaving, and then all at once it exploded like a dozen cannons shooting themselves. And the night wind was alive with a thousand unpronounceable words, screaming and crawling across the sky like a feast of burning tumblebugs. That's where they found Timmy the next morning. The sheriff and a dozen town folk found him lying in the heart of the hobo jungle. Six dead men and more roasted tumblebugs than they could count. There's a lot that believe Timmy was abused by a wandering hobo, and there's some that believe he crawled there alone. But most don't know what to believe. And in time, the whole town did its best to bury the secret with the bodies of those half-dozen hobos who'd been caught in the blast. Granny Jill had recovered completely. Although her hair never again achieved its old sheen, graying out like dust on a broken blackboard, she was worried sick. But when she saw what Timmy had done to her gatepost, she whipped him with his granddad's bell but it was more like she was trying to whip something out of herself. The belt buckle left a kind of scar that kind of looked like the mark the tumblebug man left on the gatepost. Timmy carried that mark until he became an old man, and the years crept on, and at nights, he could hear the scar talking, like it was getting set to crawl. And that was All Wood Dreams of the Sun by Steve Vernon. You know, if I've learned anything at all from Ryan Harville, there's a thin line between carving glyphs and profane and ancient languages. The other day, I'm in some gas station bathroom and someone had carved, Here I sit broken hearted, paid my dime but only farted. I didn't see any tumblebugs around, but it sure wasn't for lack of food. A little about the author. Steve Vernon has been telling and writing horror and ghost stories for the last 40 years. If you like this story, you really ought to check out as many other tales available in ebook, paperback, and audiobook form. You can find Steve Vernon's blog at stevevernonstoryteller.wordpress.com and follow him on Facebook or on Twitter at Stephen Vernon. That's Stephen with a PH and Vernon with a V. For his excellent novels and short story collections, look him up on Amazon and Audible.com. I highly recommend The Tatter Demon Omnibus and Do-Overs and Detours. For a link to his Kindle stuff, type in gbooks.biz to go right to it. 
Problem is, there's another Steve Vernon out there peddling his shitty financial self-help books. Stay clear of the old bald guy and look for the fella with the goatee. I'm not here to waste your time, folks, and neither is Steve. The real Steve, anyway. And while you're at it, please remember to stop by our Apple Podcast page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and subscribe. The charts are based on subscriptions, not listens, by the way. So feel free to accidentally subscribe as many times as you want. I won't tell anyone, I promise. And if you feel like spreading the word and helping old Drew Blood out and convincing a friend or two to subscribe to my podcast, that would help me out greatly, and I'd really appreciate it. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other podcast episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com where you can become a patron for as little as $5 a month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program and all our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there where you'll get all our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook and Instagram and sometimes Twitter. Sometimes. And remember, we're accepting submissions. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on this show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment. I'm afraid this is where we part ways, friend. At least till next week. So grab a drink for the road, but at some point you might want to think about showing up with a bottle yourself. Because you're into me for 39 drinks at this point, friend, and I could use a little reach around. <laughs> I'd like to recognize a few of our YouTube crew. Neva Soba, Z Parks 0123, and Karima from South Africa. I really appreciate the comments and support, y'all. Thank you. So here we go. Neva Soba, Z Parks 0123, and Karima Raja from South Africa. May the wind be at your back, and may the road rise up to meet you. Check your local ordinances before you go feeding the hobos. And as always, go fuck yourselves. <laughs> Oh, and Jin Dubay, I'm smoking like a chimney and drinking like a fish over here, just so you know. <laughs> Good night, y'all. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.